so when you finish, I'm rolling because I'm not certain how this rolls. But Hello and a good evening from Opus IVS and IVS 360. Hope everybody's doing well tonight. Uh, we've got a little presentation on permanent DTCs that I hope you guys are going to have some fun with. Um, Chris, you there? I am here. Excellent. So we've got uh, the boys over at Opus IVS and IVS 360 have put together a nice little presentation for you on permanent DTCs. There seems to be a lot of controversy about this across um, the states. We have uh, dealt with it in California uh, pretty extensively because of the limitations that the smog or inspection maintenance program has placed on um, our product or being able to achieve a certificate of compliance due to the uh, permanent DTCs and it's caught everybody kind of off guard. So we're going to first hit um, what are permanent DTCs and why are they there? Uh, where did they come from? And when are permanent DTCs important, especially to diagnostics? For those of you that are uh, involved in the repair of vehicles, you know that every time you turn around, it's not just a simple fix where you put a light bulb in anymore. There's some diagnostics involved, and the permanent DTCs can help you in a couple of different ways. Number one, to uh, be able to root out um, the root cause of a difficult emissions problem. And number two, if you have the savvy to be able to go to the right material, you'll be able to identify warranty issues versus um, issues that you're going to have to deal with. So in this particular presentation, I want you all to be aware that this information was designed to help technicians understand the value of permanent DTCs in diagnosis, diagnosis of root cause and emissions DTCs. Now, it's all, all permanent DTCs are going to be emissions related. It's not all inclusive. The links have been provided to assist you in understanding the subject matter. So what we're going to do is as we go through the slides, we're going to see that there's different things going on and different places for you to go to get this information you need in order to um, benefit your own understanding of what's going on with this. And so the history is very important to me and I uh, hope it is to you too because I'm going to help you to experience some of it. Um, my experience has been with California and Nevada, uh, Nevada emissions standards and training. Um, been in the emissions industry since 1996 and before that without licensing um, as an instructor. Um, in 96, I got my instructor's license for the state of California. I moved to Nevada, became a technician out there. I've done a few things in my life and it doesn't mean I know how to hold a screwdriver, but it does mean I've got some experience. Um, good or bad. So after speaking to technicians across the country, we found that there are similarities in all states. And we're going to see here that the EPA and CARB have joined together to basically homogenize the manufacture of cars since about 1999. You don't have 50, 49 state cars and California cars. But with the harmonization of the state of California and federal emission standards, all markets will be affected at some level by the implementation of these standards. Now, I know you guys are thinking, well, what's California got to do with it and all this kind of stuff. But California was always blazing the trail. And whether you like it or don't or agree with it or don't, uh, California has always been where CARB was seated. Air, which is now Air Resources Board, and they got together with the EPA and they started this homogenization. This particular article right here in uh, the Federal Register uh, indicates that EPA is clarifying its certification. So basically what it's saying is that it's joined together with the certification standards, not only from um, the way you go about testing them, but also how the cars are built, the OBD system, the onboard diagnostic system. So whether you're in Tennessee or California or New York, you're going to be experienced in the same kind of car unless you've got a 99 or earlier vehicle. So carbon uh, EPA joined forces, a uh, 12199 is this particular excerpt. And I didn't put the article in for you to see. You can see the final ruling uh, by going to the website at the bottom here. But the bottom line is 
the extension of acceptance of California OBD requirements. And the agency that was accepting it was the Environmental Protection Agency, which means that all the vehicles across the board are going to be uh, held to one standard. So we've all got the same OBD2. The, the different tailpipe emission standards across different states may be a little bit different, but the way they go about testing it, monitoring it, and the equipment on the vehicle is standardized. So as of 2-21-2019, these states have all accepted LEV, CHG, and it all has to do with carbon emissions. But if you take a look at it, California and all these states have joined together to end this harmonization of adopting green state policies, which means that they are going to be looking at testing and at some level um, performing an inspection maintenance on these vehicles. So every two years or one year or whatever it is that your uh, particular state opts out for, you're going to be getting your car tested and they're going to be looking at these things. I don't know how far behind the rest of the states are in starting to exempt or restrict certificate of compliance for emissions maintenance um, your certificate of compliance based on permanent DTCs, but I know that the permanent DTCs are uh, creating a bit of a flurry out in the field. So the problem is why we have the permanent DTCs is some vehicles were receiving a certificate of compliance in California, even though they were not in good health. And I'll go on to explain that a little bit. Basically, there was a, a loophole so the EPA and CARB got together and um, put together a group of experts and they wanted to close the loophole for the vehicles that were being allowed to pass the inspection maintenance program with false present. They knew this and we'll get into this a little bit later because they were picking up data on your vehicles. What they, did, what they did is the EPA, in the EPA analysis, California had a loophole that existed in the two-trip code criteria. And um, the exemption of the EVAP monitor, allowing vehicles to pass emissions along with undetected system faults or systems that had not yet been tested. So this increased the uh, tailpipe emissions and also decrease the fuel economy, which was counterproductive to what EPA and CARB had in, in store for us. Um, the evidence generated from uh, IUMPR, the in-use monitor performance ratios, which we'll get into, that's a whole, we'll talk about it a little bit, but that's a whole nother subject matter. That's a, another webinar that we'd have to get involved in. Um, we're seeing that some of these vehicles were being uh, used for a period of two years with the check engine light on and then setting the check engine light off and then defeating the monitor for the uh, EVAP, setting a code by running the tank either below a quarter or over three quarters full or only running it for one set of monitors, running it through one trip and then the next morning running it into the smog technician and getting the uh, smog tech done. And because there was that open hole for you could pass smog with out running the monitor for the EVAP system, you could get a certificate of compliance. So these were the laws and rules that we had in play. Um, these particular uh, indications were in California. Yeah, up to 96 to 99, we did have any two monitors would be allowed to be unrun, but the supplement May 4th, 2015 only allowed one, and then 2,000 newer cars, only the EVAP system. So you could have any one in 96 to 99, but it got down to only the EVAP system in 2020. And then diesels, again, a whole nother kettle of fish. So what was happening was that a lot of the individuals that were involved in uh, either the inspection and maintenance program or individuals that use the vehicles themselves, the owners of the vehicle were gaming the system. Um, this is when technicians purposely circumvent certain monitors because the system still contains unrepaired faults. And 
EPA didn't like it, so they put in permanent DTCs. Uh, California IM test did not require EVAP monitor to have been run or completed in order to pass the smog test. Consequently, these guys are getting away with just clearing the codes, running it through smog after running the monitors, the majority of the monitors, running it through the smog program, getting their certificate of compliance. Two days later, the EVAP monitor throws a code, and then they run for the next two years on that failed system, which... Um, if you talk to anybody that's gotten it repaired and gotten the check engine light off, you know that when the car's in fuel control, it's using far less fuel. And the secondary thing is, if with the car repaired, the amount of money you save just on fuel alone would absolutely pay for the repairs in most cases. So they were gaming the system. Vehicles with fuel evaporative faults could game the system by clearing codes and drive the drive cycle, getting all the other monitors to complete, then have their smog test done before the engine light was commanded on and it having made a judgment that there was a defect in the system. How did they know? Well, that's a good question. Mode 1 and PID pin 30, um, the warm-up sense codes cleared. This information is available anytime you go into an inspection maintenance where a data acquisition device is used. They plug into the car and they're pulling... Well, it's a data acquisition device, so they're probably acquiring data. How much data? What data? Well, they're pretty closed lip about that, but we know that they are getting mode 1, PID 30, PID 31, distance traveled since codes cleared, and the diff distance traveled with modes uh, with the uh, MIL on, PID 21. Um, they had everybody locked down. They know what's going on. It's just how do they keep them from violating this? Um, they're giving it to you on your own recognizance. Make sure the car's running well, smog it, and have a nice day. Now they're going to hold your feet to the fire because we've got permanent DTCs. So the permanent DTCs hold in memory that cannot be cleared, not by battery disconnect, not be by enhanced or um, generic scan tools. It's basically not able to be cleared by human hands. It holds it in memory permanently. If you cleared the codes, the permanent DTC still stays, stays there. The cool thing about the Drive Pro is, uh, as you can see down here at the bottom, the if in the event that you select the permanent DTCs or historical DTCs in memory, when you do a quick test on the vehicle, it does display them for you. Now, I'm going to get into some stuff here that's a little bit different than what you probably heard before, but most generic scan tools, when you ask for a code request, you're only asking for mode 3. And that's not going to give you permanent DTCs, which is this 10th mode that everybody's talking about, which, by the way, is mode 0A. Um, I made a mistake going to a SAE conference and mentioning mode 10. They looked away from their sandwich for a moment to give me a dirty look and went back to it. And I didn't have any more conversations with them throughout the remainder of the evening due to the fact that they knew I was not uh, enhanced in my understanding as they were. So permanent DTCs have been implemented to make more difficult for a vehicle owner or technician to clear the fault memory, which can potentially allow the vehicle to pass inspection without being repaired. While the readiness monitors were also originally intended to address these purposes, um, the readiness monitors, are, with the uh, exclusion that they had, um, made it possible for us to step around it. Permanent DTCs also provide a much more direct and accurate indication that attempt that an attempt may have been made by a vehicle owner or technician to circumvent the inspection. So whether you, inspection and maintenance is a lot of things. Sure, it's about keeping your car in good shape, but it's also to detect the occurrence of fraud. In the event that we've got a program vehicle or something along those lines, we'll be able to see that information very, very clearly through the current inspection maintenance program. So permanent DTTs help to identify vehicles with faults present. Now, in a lot of cases, you might find that these permanent DTCs are manufacturer things that uh, in the first eight years, 
or 80,000 miles, there may be a situation where the aftermarket repair facility doesn't necessarily need to take care of the problem. There may be a flash or a fix or a recall that these permanent DTCs have problems they don't clear, and consequently, they need to go back to the dealer to be reset. On the other hand, you've got uh, you and me and the repair facilities that are out there facing these things. And if it's an emissions failure where the car has to get it cleared up before it can go through smog, then you've got yourself a problem. Now the problem lies on you. Excuse me. To be able to correctly identify, find the root cause and repair the problem, getting the customer back on the road. California was the first to implement permanent DTCs as a reason to deny a certificate of compliance. Other green states, such as New York and others, have uh, I've heard stories from the guys in New York where they talk about t um, going around the uh, or repairing around the cat. Um, in California, we were repairing around the EVAP system because that was the loophole that we had available. But all the green states and everybody has some way or another to sidestep the system. I'm sure you guys know uh, what it is I'm talking about. So the loopholes have to be closed. We got it. They're going to find a way to get it over it. They're going to put permanent DTCs in place so that we can't step around it. Um, in July 19, 2019, new standards were adopted in California, 2010 in newer cars. Uh, the vehicles were denied a certificate of compliance anytime um, that they had a PDCC. Um, some 2010 cars do not support those permanent DTCs. Um, a vehicle with uh, permanent DTC stored will fail the uh, smog check regardless of whether the mill is on or not. So that's in California. Again, I'm saying California a lot. It, it's going to spread. Um, vehicle manufacturers have issued extended warranties, recalls, and repair campaigns for some vehicles that have trouble properly clearing these permanent DTCs. These vehicles shall be listed in Table 6 of a particular uh, piece of information I'm going to give you here. Um, this is an example of the permanent DTC failure for a uh, smog inspection or sample inspection report. This particular uh, vehicle here has failed for permanent trouble codes. Um, this particular vehicle here, if you'll notice uh, in the lower s section here, uh, all the rest of the emission systems have passed. It's failed for permanent trouble codes. And permanent trouble codes. And we're going to back up a second. And this is just a little circle that we do occasionally. The 10th mode, if you're going by um, CARB and SAE documents, um, mode 10 is named 0A. So what you're looking for is a scan tool that can read mode 0A. You already, most of the time, your scan tools are going to allow you to request live data, mode 1. You're, in some cases, request freeze frame data. If you're going to read, if you have a code reader, it reads mode 3. Um, you can usually see mode 4 and clear and requesting. But some of these other modes may or may not be available to your tool. It's not because it's not there. Generic scan tools all have the ability to be able to reach into this. It's the manufacturer's responsibility to be able to choose what modes it wants to look at and what level of information it wants to see. In the Drive Pro tool, we've got historical DTCs, clear DTCs, and freeze frame information. And the other thing that's real cool about this particular tool um, is that we have the ability, they've got 140 techs out here that do about 800 calls per office per day, and they have the ability to walk you through how to get the most out of the tool and how to get the information out of the car you need to find the root cause. Once you find the root cause, it's very, very easy to pull it out. But without the tools and the help, and I'm a firm believer that everybody should ask for help every time that it's offered to them. And uh, 
I know that uh, Opus IBS and IBS 360 does a wonderful job of being able to provide that help. We've got a lot of people that are very, very serious about uh, being in touch with us on a very regular basis. So by protecting the fault codes from being cleared, a tattletale identified the sus suspect vehicles. Not only was data acquisition device or the DAD used in vehicle inspections to access mode 0A, but it also accessed a lot of other information in the vehicle that most of us don't look at most of the time. Permanent DTCs were not available to mode 3 code requests. So when you go into it with your scan tool or your little scan device, you're going to get what you asked for. You're going to get the DTCs that are currently present. So a lot of the smog technicians and whatnot would go in and do their scan tool to take a look at it, no codes present, go in and run it for smog, and they wouldn't see the permanent DTC until it was on the smog report that you guys saw just a bit earlier. The techs may have never seen it, at least not on the until the emissions test. PDTCs are only available in mode 0A. So consider that when you're purchasing a scan tool or uh, getting involved in diagnostic. Again, SAE International is showing a, a picture of the J1979, and if you're really interested in going into the documents and seeing how this stuff works, um, the 1968.2, J1979, et cetera, et cetera, there's a lot of web links I'm going to give you in the pages that are in here in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. I'm certain that you'll be able to download that and take those links or do screenshots as we're doing it tonight. Um, Again, if you take a look at uh, Mode 0A information, um, you can find that on page 142 um, of this particular document. So here's your Mode 0A request emissions related documents, trouble codes, and permanent date status. Um, the permanent DTCs will not clear by battery disconnect. We've talked about that. And it's intended not to be cleared by human hands. On some scan tools, permanent DTCs are available. Uh, but remember, mode three, if you're only pulling the live um, current trouble codes, you're in mode three, you're not going to see the permanent DTC. And um, a permanent DTC can help you do a lot of things. If a guy brought a, a customer bought, brought the car to your shop and they want to get a problem solved that keeps reoccurring, that permanent DTC, if it's an emissions problem, may show up as a P code or a U code in the permanent DTC. So you've got network codes and uh, emissions codes that are all going to be stored to that permanent DTC memory in mode 0A. Any diagnostic trouble code that is commanding the mill on will be stored to the non-volatile memory and shall be logged as a permanent code at the end of that ignition cycle. P codes and some U codes are saved as permanent DTCs. You guys all know the difference between non-volatile and volatile RAM. Volatile RAM um, is able to be released, not really... Uh, erased non-volatile ram is uh it has to figure it out itself actually the obd system has to take a look at it and verify that it's uh repair has been made and then go into clearing its own code um so pdtc is what makes them different than other dtcs well when you were um using your just your DTCs, when you cleared them, both the freeze frame and the information for the code were gone. It was lost, never to be seen again. Without permanent DTCs, clear codes were simply lost along with the freeze frame information. The idea was to keep the permanent record of these issues that had not been repaired. So if I clear the codes and try to run it through smog, they're going to catch me. Permanent DTCs were designed to be tamper-proof. The only way to clear the code to be to repair the problem and allow the OBD system to verify the repair under similar conditions to the failure. And this is why freeze frame is so very important. If you go and clear the codes, you know, if you have to meet a set of similar conditions, how are you going to do that if you don't know what they were? The computer still knows what those similar conditions were, but you don't. So similar conditions to be stored in Information from the freeze frame data, CARB stated that the minimum similar conditions must consist of having an engine speed, 
within 375 RPM of the moment of the offense when it set the code, uh, load conditions within 20%, and the same warm-up status, hot, cold, um, either an open or closed loop. So you have to be able to duplicate there. There may be many others. It may be uh, particular miles per hour or something else that may be associated with it as well. Um, freeze frame, by the way, is mode two, zero two, mode zero two. So in this particular case, this is what CARB and SAE documents mentioned, that these are the minimum required PIDs that should be available in freeze frame to help the technician recreate the drive condition for the fault. So if you've got a permanent DTC, it has this freeze frame information. The one thing that I'm going to lay in here, though, is that the latest check engine light that came on is going to re-up the freeze frame information. So if you've got several subsequent codes, the permanent DTC may have already washed the freeze frame information out. So these are the things that you will be having in your freeze frame, your calculated load, engine RPM, fuel trim, fuel pressure, vehicle speed, coolant temperature, intake manifold pressure, closed or open loop status, and the fault code that caused the permanent DTC. Now, in this particular case, I want you to take a look at the freeze frame information we've got here. We see that we've got an intake air temperature sensor, and this is your freeze frame information. And you can tell a lot from this, and this is a, a great deal more information than is always available, but this is about the norm. But we can tell that the car, if we take a look at the uh, intake air temp at startup versus the intake air temp now, the initial intake air temp was 83.7 degrees, and then it went to minus 40. Well, how long did that take to happen? Well, the engine speed was 354 RPM, but if we take a look down here, we see that the engine was run time of 14 seconds. So this thing ran for 14 seconds. It definitely wasn't running. That's not idle speed, 354. So it was running. It had an initial temperature of a particular uh, value. Then the sensor glitched out. And when it did, it saw that there was a bunch of cold air coming into the intake. How does the computer respond to putting a bunch of cold air in the intake? Well, let's throw some fuel at it because we know that it's got a high oxygen content and the air is very dense. What does that make the engine do? Well, it makes it stumble. So you can see here by taking a look at the freeze frame information, you can build a story just on the information that's here. You may be able to recreate the failure. So in my mind, this ran for 17 seconds. The sensor, whether the wiring became a uh, higher resistance than normal or if it, the sensor became an open, it went to a very, very low temperature. And then it threw a lot of fuel at it and it stumbled the engine, nearly killed it. Now, if you were trying to recreate this as a permanent DTC, which is what this would have stored as, without this permanent, without this information here, would it be more difficult to be able to diagnose? I say it would. So with the permanent DTC coming into play, they didn't want to make it forever, forever. If you've got a permanent DTC, you can't get the car through emissions. So they came up with this 3500 rule. And a bunch of colleagues of uh, in the automotive industry out here in Southern California attended some bag meetings with the Bureau of Automotive Repair. And they expressed their concerns about the grandma who only drove 12 miles a year and how 30 warm-up cycles would never happen with that vehicle and 500 miles. Well, she barely does half that in a year. She goes to church on Sunday, and that's the extent of her driving. And so they got together and they came up with a, a, a secondary plan. They said, okay, 15 warm-up cycles and 200 miles. The machine will recognize that by the data in your vehicle and give you a pass on it if you have made 15 warm-up cycles and 200 miles without a secondary offense or without another um, episode of this particular failure occurring. So if you get the car repaired and drive it under this scenario, the emissions machine in California will ignore um, the failure of the certificate of compliance or denial of certificate of compliance in the event that you have 15 warm-up cycles and 200 miles on without a secondary offense or failure. This is based on PID 30 and PID 31 that I talked to you about on slide 15. 
Uh, so the implementation of the permanent DTC, it started in 2010 year model. Actually, a lot of vehicles had uh, permanent DTCs uh, before that. Um, but it was completed by 2012 year model. And so PDTCs have been around for um, over 10 years. This is also, um, you start talking and thinking about it, and I know this is a, a term not many people throw around, but the IUMPR, in-use monitor performance ratio, which uh, I'm gonna agree with you, it's a completely different subject it's for another webinar and not tonight, but it is useful information. It was implemented in 2005, and uh, the various uh, individuals that are looking at our information coming out of cars, um, I've been looking at this information for over 15 years. In use monitor performance ratio, I'll talk about that a little bit in a moment, but this is a, another real helpful tool that we can use to be able to diagnose vehicles, especially ones that are having trouble running monitors. Um, Defailed information can be found in your California, or California code of regulations. Um, this particular one is the 1968.2 CARB document that it's referring to. Um, this is in Title 13 of the CCR. But it, it, I just put this up here as an excerpt. It starts showing you, if you start reading through this stuff, I, don't, I know it's going to be a long read for you, and you got a full-time job and all that kind of stuff. But if you start looking through it, you're going to start seeing where a lot of these fingers and a lot of these uh, tendrils start to touch base and start to make sense. Um, I'll give you the information on how to get to it in some of these uh, upcoming slides. You'll find that there's uh, web addresses that are associated with it, and uh, you can get to it pretty easy. So IUMPR, in-use monitor performance ratio, it gives the number of times that the vehicle is in the conditions to run the monitor versus the number of times the monitor has made a judgment. So the minimal acceptable ratio, depending on the monitor, someplace between 26 and 52%. So if I've got an oxygen sensor monitor that's running, it was in the conditions to run 500 times, and it ran 285 times. That's over 50%. This is a pretty healthy car. If I've got the same car that ran was in the conditions to run and ran uh, 500 times and ran the monitors, 641 times, well, that's the later model car that's running the monitors multiple times a trip. But you can see that the car is really, really healthy. What happens is when various particular portions of the monitor are not able to run, remember, we don't ever get any codes for a monitor. You've never seen a code for a monitor. You've seen codes for individual components of the monitor, oxygen sensor or whatever it is. That particular component had an open shorter ground. It had a, a rationality code. It had some kind of a code that indicated that it wasn't up to snuff. But let's say that this particular oxygen sensor that's involved in the catalyst monitor is just a little puny. It's not feeling so good. It can't quite get the rise time it needs quick enough. It's not enough to fail. Kind of like a guy coming in and saying, I don't feel good today. And the boss going, well, can you hold a wrench? Get on, tell me how you feel in a couple hours. Um, that's what the monitor does. It'll keep looking at it. It'll keep pinging the oxygen sensor until it gets a determination. So every time it's going through the monitor, it, no, nah, it's not bad and it's not good. It's not, you know, it's just, it's riding the edge but I can't trust it, so I'm going to suspend the catalyst monitor because I can't trust the oxygen sensor monitor. Now, I still don't have a code for it, but if I was looking at IUMPR and I was seeing that I was in the conditions for the monitor to run 746 times and it had run twice, I'd have to be a little suspect that that oxygen sensor monitor isn't making a determination because possibly it's a, a little deteriorated. Um, so you say you can't get the cat monitor to run and the O2 sensor has only run twice and been in the condition 738 times. Is it possible to run a catalyst monitor without the O2? No. Well, if the O2 isn't within the band to be approved, will it suspend all subsequent monitors? Yes. So you may not run the catalyst monitor for as long as you live. So 
some DTC, permanent DTCs have errors. This is a real good website for you. Um, if you go in and download this particular piece of information, you can see in there I've chosen one of the pages, but these are known issues that uh, California has recognized and provided for their smog technicians on vehicles with permanent DTCs. And then you'll see, and the funny thing about this is, you know, I had some uh, argument out a couple of times with guys talk, well, it's not going to be a network code. There's not going to be any net U codes in there. Well, the very, uh, I think, third or fourth one down in this particular illustration has identified that uh, CARB and BAR have identified that there are U codes and P codes, and these things are situations that you're not going to fix. So it would be a really, really good resource to have this in your, you know, toolbox. Go ahead and print it out. It's free to everybody. And um, there's various different versions of it. This is the 72720 model, but there was a 127 model. If those vehicles haven't been fixed in the field, then those, fe those vehicles are still out there with the same problems. And they do change the content as they get more and more things resolved. So in this particular case, uh, there's a few in the right column that say that it's out for resolution with the manufacturer. So they haven't got a resolution on it yet, but the emissions machine is ignoring them. But if you run into them with your scan tool and you think you're gonna diagnose them without this piece of information saying that it's an error code, you're gonna be chasing your tail for a bit and that's not a good place to be. We wanna see you guys be efficient and uh, well taken care of out there in the field. So the confirmed DTC to permanent DTC status is going to happen no later than the end of the current ignition cycle, subsequent to any time that the confirmed DTC is commanded to mill light on. Um, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Right, that was a tickle. Um. During the 440 warm-up cycles of the self-healing process, only the confirmed fault will read. Why is that? I know that I'm talking, this is, the reason why I'm throwing the question in here is to make you think about it a little bit. So if you're going through a self-healing process of 40 warm-up cycles, and the first one it went through eliminated the permanent DTC because it did not see it under similar conditions having the same fault. On the first good trip, the permanent DTC clears and only the confirmed history codes will be uh, present for you to view. So be aware that there's a couple of different ways to diagnose and walk through the repair of these permanent DTCs. And a lot of it uh, has to do with where they are stored or how they are stored or what kind of codes they are. There are some codes with a minimum ratio, some codes without a minimum ratio. And here I go talking about IUMPR again. But remember that the code will only be stored at the end of the engine ignition off cycle. And uh, generic th uh, three, the show diagnostic trouble codes, only mode zero A will show the permanent DTCs just as a footnote for you. Um, the permanent DTC shall be stored in non-volatile uh, memory um, and not be erased by any diagnostic services, generic or enhanced, we've covered this, or by disconnecting power from the ECU. Typically, the code is written to a double E prom. You can, however, clear the codes, which will take away the freeze frame and will be very, very difficult for you to be able to match similar conditions. Um, by the way, that clearing the codes before you've uh, saved the freeze frame information is not listed under the Clever Ideas category of your uh, local repair manual. Um, there are two types of permanent DTCs without minimum ratio. The fault codes that set at the first occurrence, this is your misfire and various others. And then with minimum ratio, this is where your IUMPR plays in, where we're seeing the number of times it was in conditions to run, the number of times it ran. The minimum ratio are multi-trip fault codes, okay? And they're going to change the diagnostic strategy on how you're going to look at it a little bit. So the conditions without minimum ratio are your misfire, your fuel system monitor, comprehensive component, your open shorts and grounds. These fault codes will set on the first occurrence. Um, There are many times when not clearing the codes and letting them heal normally or naturally uh, would be the best 
a way for you to go ahead and repair these. Let's say we've got an open and a throttle position sensor for um, on some car and it set a permanent DTC. Well, why would you want to rebuild all the monitor data for the EVAP system and every other system that's in there when you can just replace the car, put it under similar conditions, drive it, and it'll immediately erase the permanent DTC? That probably would be in your best interest. I'm going to have to kick this along a little bit. We're running a little bit short on time. I know I get long-winded and telling stories and all that kind of stuff, but I'm trying to um, bring you into the group and uh, hopefully help you to understand a little more what's going on uh, with these permanent DTCs and get you quicker out of the uh, service bay with a repaired vehicle. Um, conditions with minimum ratio or non-continuous monitors, these are um, these particular Monitors are multi-trip monitors. Some of them, in the case of uh, SCR on a diesel, may not run for 15,000 miles. So you may have a bit of a time waiting for that monitor to run again. Um, OBD2 system is not uh, required to track and report in-use performance ratio other than those specifically outlined above. Okay, So these are the ones that they are tracking. Conditions without minimum ratio, the OBD2 system shall erase the permanent DTC if at the end of a driving cycle. Now, the driving cycle is another thing I've included in the PowerPoint, but it's a carb drive cycle, and you'll want to adhere to it pretty closely. There's some caveats that go with it. And if you call in and uh, get on the tech line with Opus IVS, um, I'm sure they can get in touch with me and I can walk you through some of it if you run into a trouble with a, one of your emissions related problem children. Cars. Um, the monitor has run and made one or more determinations during the drive cycle that the malfunction of the component or systems is not present and has not made any determinations within the same, same driving cycle indicated that the malfunction is still present. In this case, why clear codes? You just go in, you repair the vehicle, which is all they're looking for you to do anyway. Drive the drive cycle and, um, under similar conditions and make the code go away. Get rid of your permanent DTC. So conditions without a minimum ratio, the monitor has not made any determinations. You'd go out and you drive it under similar, the malfunction is present under the most recent drive cycle in which the, the similar fault conditions occurred. Um, this is mode two freeze frame information, so you're going to have to match up the similar conditions in order to make it work. Um, this is as per CARB. The CARB specified drive cycle may satisfy this as a single drive cycle. So you may be able to just go in, do a drive cycle, follow the conditions, and that's going to there's some other things that I need to bring you up to speed on as to how to enter into the conditions. But this is how GSB or the Ford with their generic um, service bulletin relayed the information that they had received from CARB as to how to deal with it. And I think it's funny that um, they know that there are some issues. Do not attempt to diagnose or, diagnose or repair without uh, customer concern or um, being referred from an IM uh, inspection. So they know what's going on. And then they give you on the second page of this a little bit of information about how to uh, repair it. And it mirrors the CARB document, but remember that we always go to the CARB documents first and then go to the manufacturer. They should paraphrase the CARB document. In any case, the CARB document's always right whatever the manufacturer says is their way of looking at things. So it gives two ways here in being able to clear the diagnostic trouble code, whether um, at the very end of this uh, little sentence here, it says after you clear the DTC, you go, go out and drive it and uh, meet the conditions, and it should clear. And then it gives a whole other uh, list of scenarios that you can go about clearing this permanent diagnostic trouble code. And again, um, this particular PowerPoint will be available for download if you want to peruse it or go through it again. Um, the information in the SAA generic scan tool can be some of the 
best information that you can get on uh, verification of repairs. Remember that permanent DTCs are not in manufacturer specific, only in the generic scan tool. CARB makes the governing ruling, and then SAE makes the guidelines for scan tool operation. So if you're getting ready to buy a scan tool or getting ready to buy a, a data acquisition device for any vehicle to interrogate it, make sure that you're up to speed with what the device is able to do. Um, especially in the case of uh, if you're going to be doing heavy diagnostics. Uh, the more information you can gain, the smarter you are, and the smarter you are, the easier it is to fix it. Um, me personally, I call on other people that are smarter than I am and uh, get them to help me out with it, but that's just me. Um, there are phase in ears, so when you're taking a look at the guidelines for what uh, monitors are on the car, and what PIDs are available. There are phase in ears for those particular monitors and those particular PIDs. Uh, excuse me, not for the PIDs, but for those particular model, monitor. Um, if the scan tool doesn't support it, it doesn't mean necessarily that the vehicle doesn't support it. So just be aware. Implementation of regulations by year. The following slide is to indicate how monitors were phased in, knowing where and why some monitors are phased in may help you to be able to diagnose and repair these vehicles easier. And in this particular case, we've got um, your, uh, take a look here and see what I've got for, uh, get my, eyes on here to be able to help you guys. In-use monitor performance ratio was started to phase in. Now it was a limited function all the way back since uh, I can remember, but we were mandated to start implementing in, in uh, 2005 through th 2008. That's in-use monitor performance and permanent DTCs. Uh, again, we started implementing in 2010. There was some limited implementation um, earlier on for different manufacturers, but it was fully implemented by 2012, as you can see down here. So these cars have permanent DTCs and IUMPR in them for the last 10 or 15 years, 25 years, what, or 10 or 15 years anyway. And in this particular case, uh, 2005 would have been for the in-use performance monitor uh, ratios. You would... Uh, be able to see that information for a good long time. In conclusion, PTC is related to P codes and U codes. They will appear and able them in similar conditions criteria are met without default reoccurrence. You will be able to clear them out of them. The system is repaired. And that's the key to what we need to do. We need to find out what the root cause is and repair. Summary tables will help you. And again, summary tables are another uh, uh, hold another subject, and we can get into those, but in brief form, they are the inner drive cycle, the conditions needed to met to be met in order to I, to perform one portion of a monitor. If you clear codes, be sure to document the freeze frame first, then run the monitors to verify your repairs after you fix the car. Uh, the carb drive cycle that I promised you about, this is um, both the long and short version. Basically, this is what they're using in order to uh, get the car in all conditions to run all monitors. So if you were to follow this drive trace, and, and it's including stopping, sitting, accelerating, maintaining speed, slowing down, stopping, sitting, not touching the brakes, there's a whole bunch, a list of things that are included in the drive cycle to enable all the monitors to run. So, but this is the drive cycle. These are the speeds at which you travel and the level of acceleration which you use in order to get these drive cycles to operate and to do basically enable and uh, perform all the system monitors. Um, Ohio had a piece of information that I thought was interesting. It very, very closely mirrors the EPA and CARB standards, um, but it's an easy read version. And this is the link to it. 
and um, there is some research. But the more you get into this, the more I hope that you become excited, the more that I hope that you become intrigued with uh, the information that's out there and how to get to the uh, root cause of a problem. This is a brief uh, piece of the summary tables. This is, uh, again, you can go and take a look at it, the link I've provided for you. Um, but I hope that you get excited and reach out and ask for help, whether it's inside the shop arena or whether it's uh, people that have a greater level of uh, experience than you. Reach out to the smart guys out there, men, that can help you, the guys that can make your day more efficient, the guys that can help you um, be able to get the car out of the shop more quickly with a more well-satisfied client, um, the guys that um, can provide you a level of efficiency. I, I know that there's a lot of folks out there, probably guys standing in the next shop or the next stall over to you. Um, IVS 360 provides a group of guys that uh, are extraordinary in the industry. I've been in this industry for a few years, although uh, uh, I've been all around in all different portions of the industry. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are willing to help and to have the goods to be able to help you. Um, but it, it always starts with you asking first. And us type A personalities that if I can't fix it, it ain't broken. Um, we have a hard time reaching out and asking other people for a little bit of a hand. And uh, sometimes we don't realize the, the amount of time we're wasting by not just reaching out and letting somebody help us. Um, so this is your, OB, uh, your, let me back you up one page here. Um, you ever had a car that had, uh, pre 2010 in most cases, but I uh, had a crazy wonky, uh, fuel trim problem and, uh, the pre cat O twos were reading 900 millivolts. It was rich, rich, rich post cat O twos are, uh, well, we've always been told those are only just to monitor the cat. So those don't matter. Um, but there's always been this term thrown around about final fuel trim. Well, what does final fuel trim mean? Well, what final fuel trim means is they are using the post cat O2s to take a look at the fuel trim that would keep the cat healthy. So they're basically overriding bank one sensor one with bank two sensor two information. And even though bank one sensor one says it's rich, they're still adding fuel because bank one sensor two says the cat is lean. They don't want to go that way. So if you go into the initiation of uh, when it was implemented, so the post-cat O2 wasn't monitored, not fully implemented until 2011. But we got cars all the way back here that had, there was added um, checks that were for functionality of the sensor clear back in 96. Now I know there's some early Hondas out there that were using final fuel trim before 2000 and the, they would drive you crazy trying to get past fuel trim problems. And it turned out that the post cat O2 that wasn't supposed to have anything to do with um, fuel trim or uh, being in fuel control was actually because that post cat O2 had a bad heater and wasn't coming online or any of a number of different reasons um, was causing the fuel trim to go wonky and you couldn't figure out why. Uh, Subarus did it. Hondas did it. Mercedes did it. At any rate, but there was no monitor for that particular post-CAD O2 until clear back in 2009. They started implementing them. Why weren't they watching them? Well, because there wasn't any uh, information in the CARB manual that said that they had to. So here's a fun fact, and this is what I just explained to you. Um, final fuel trim was being controlled by S2 O2 overriding S1 to protect the catalyst, yet the S2 sensor had no monitor. With lean and rich codes on these vehicles, be sure, please check and pinpoint test the S2 on these things. Make sure the heater's working, make sure their connection's good, make sure they're not a half a million miles old because everybody was told they didn't make any difference except for monitoring the cat, they do. Um, and here's your webinar exclusive, and with that, I'm going to, uh, Toss it back to the boys on the other side of the uh, electronic tunnel here. My friend Chris over on the other coast. 
Um, be sure that you guys take a look at the exclusive webinar offer that you're giving away a free docking station with the purchase of the Drive Pro ES. Um, it's a licensed OE diagnostic software, brand specific expert guidance, and built in remote flash programming. The biggest thing about this, and I started this business for money in 1969, and I wish that I'd had help a lot of times throughout my career. It's just, um, it um, was a situation where uh, I was too proud to ask, and uh, I cut my own throat. But that's, neither here nor there. One of the coolest things that goes on in this industry right now is with all the different makes and models. I mean, what's BMW you got you know, 134 different models out there over the course of its life. How can you know all of them? There's a group of guys and gals over here at uh, IVS 360 that's available on the phone for you. Um, 9 a.m. Eastern to 6 p.m. Pacific that are willing to step up with you with the factory information. The cool thing about this tool is it's got some uh, J2534 device in it that we can actually log in with the factory tool um, into your cars if we were there. And we can also uh, pull out any of the information that you need if you're not seeing it on the school, on the tool, um, and also walk you through any of the diagnostic patterns you need to go through. And if, you know, I mean, if uh, we do 1,000, 1,600 calls a day, and the chances of us running into that car you haven't seen one of in two years and knowing exactly where the uh, diagrams and the pin, uh, step by step procedure for putting that timing chain on and even the inside tips because we've done it ourselves before and been able to, and would be able to give you a hand. Um, all these things would work really, really well for you if you had the opportunity to ask for it. And that comes along with the Drive Pro ES and its docking station. So, um, you guys take a look at it, see what makes sense to you, and I'll look forward to hearing from you on the other end of the phone call over here at IVS 360 and Opus IVS. You guys have a great day. Chris, you there? I'm here. Don't go anywhere yet. We got tons of questions. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not questions. We, we, you're here for another six hours. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh okay so, what, what do we got so let me go sc scroll through this stuff here so that was a that was a lot of awesome information that you had um so let, let me just go find some um i had a question here from uh the uh, appropriately named steven steven um he wanted to know uh couldn't the technician swap in another engine ecu drive to pass monitors then smog and then swap back to the original ecu what year's the car? Would we have to talk life for like and apples and oranges, depending on what year it is. If it's got a VIN encoded in it, you've also got a CVN uh, Cal ID that is specific to the vehicle. You go slapping another PCM in it, it's going to read the wrong PCM. It's going to read the wrong VIN number. It's going to read the wrong Cal ID. It's going to be a data mismatch, and you're still going to have a failed smog. Awesome. Just saying. Awesome. So, so, so basically your answer is, no, fix the car. <laughs> yeah, no, fix the car. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, I mean, a lot of these things hurt my feelings too. Um, <laughs> there, it's getting it's getting to the point what you what you don't know do, does hurt you. And uh, with the data acquisition device, especially in California and the green states that are using the IM services, um, they can see everything in this car. And uh, it's going to be very, very difficult for you to ring around the rosy and slap, you know, another. We just, we all did it. We we're technicians. We we're flat rate mechanics. And we all got to the point where we knew the fast way to get around the problem. Mm -hmm. They're closing the doors. We're going to have to find some new doors or <laughs> uh, we're going to have to fix some problems. What else you got? Well, before we go on, I guess you, uh, there, was, there was some uh, some. Uh, I guess some things we're, we're, we're talking a lot about California um, and granted, grant, granted you're a California boy and uh, you got the prettiest tan on the planet. Um, but um, why, why are we harping so much on California and what California is doing? Yeah, basically uh, 
the deal is that EPA in California with the harmonization of all the green states have gotten to the point where they've adopted California regulations. And I know that most of the country, myself included when I was in Nevada and other states, man, I resisted California for, you know, every inch of my body. I didn't want to be a part of it because it was a whole bunch of information that I didn't want to have to deal with. And it was a whole bunch of rules and regulations that weren't affecting me. Well, with the green states and the harmonization, all the vehicles have the same diagnostic platform in them. And so it behooves us to be able to use that platform to our advantage to um, be able to repair the vehicle. Um, the fact that I'm from California, maybe I got exposed to some of the stuff a little earlier than some of the other people because I'm in the emissions program, but that was because I was forced to fix this stuff um, before possibly you guys were. And, the thing is, with being on the phone with Opus IVS and being a technician and working through some of these emissions problems across the uh, country, is just because I say California, I could be saying uh, Comac or anything else. It, it's all the same thing. We're all feel we're all being basically. Um, facing the same set of scenarios with the same kind of failures on the cars. And no matter where it is I'm from, I'll throw my arm around the Comac boys anytime. Um, it isn't specific to any particular place in the, in the country. It's that this is the, where the information has come from. And unfortunately I'm from there. So I said it too often. I apologize. <laughs> Don't apologize. <laughs> it's a great point. <laughs> so, I, hope that, I hope this helps. Oh, so no, you're, you're, oh, you're helping out. Oh, and don't, don't even get squirrely because we got a ton more to go. Like I said, you're here for another six hours. <laughs> <laughs> I got six hours. Let's do this thing. <laughs> so Eric wanted to know, he was talking about your 15-200 rule. Um, okay. So after 15 warm-ups warm and 200 miles, uh, the o OIS will pass the vehicle even though the P PDTC is present? That's correct. And in, in the emission systems that I'm dealing with out here where I live, um, it isn't the car that sees the 15 warm-up cycles, although the car does report it. It does have that information inside of it. But um, the OIS system itself is set up in such a way that once it sees the information from the car saying that it's got over um, these 15 warm-up cycles, that it has run the monitors, um, it has over 200 miles on it, then it just ignores the fact that it's got a permanent DTC in it. And in some cases, it's necessary because some of the permanent DTCs are rogue codes that won't go away. Um, Dodge had a real big problem. Uh, excuse me, not Dodge. One of the manufacturers uh, of uh, vehicles here in the States um, had a real big problem with the permanent DTCs being just that. They were permanent. They never went away. And every time you cycled the key, it reset it reset the counters so it looked like as if the permanent DTC was there just now. Well, that but sucks. Was, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> but that was one of those things that they had learned to get over. Awesome. Well, we got another question along the same lines. Okay. Um, and my good friend, uh, Hans Jorgensen, uh, Volkswagen guy, so this is why he's asking know. this question. Uh, yeah, Hans is an awesome dude. Um, yeah. So he asked you, uh, if you can run a readiness monitor, again, he's talking about Volkswagen and stuff because, you know, that's what he does. So if you can run a readiness monitor without clearing faults, will that get rid of the PDTC if it passes the readiness monitors? If you met similar conditions. Now, we had um, a situation with a particular vehicle here a while ago that the permanent DTC was set at 140 miles an hour. <laughs> I'm not doing that test drive. It was a McLaren. Um, and they were having a heck of a time getting past it. We got a lot of test drives, and it was fun, but um, it it wanted to see the 15 warm-up cycles and or 200 miles, and nobody was uh, willing to take the chance to stick it up to 140 miles an hour to get it to um, clear the permanent DTC. So um, the question about the Volkswagen running it through the monitors, if it saw similar condition and it cleared the PTTC, then yes, because the first time you run it through the monitors and it sees the per the similar conditions and no fault present, it will clear the PDTC itself. So if you're running the monitor in bay, 
um, and running all of them in bay, uh, it will not clear them because you need to you need to see the same condition. So if the, it, it needs to see same similar conditions, correct? How how is he running it in bay um, and getting similar load conditions? Oh, with my question with, with with Volkswagen, there's a whole procedure. You can run all the monitors. Right, but the road. load conditions are. The CARB rules state that it has to be under similar load conditions within um, up 20% of the similar load conditions. Mm -hmm. it, even if you're running on the dyno, it would be very, very difficult to duplicate load conditions that occurred on road. Okay. So that, you, you know what? If he wants to throw that question into our uh, Opus IVS crew, um, I'll do some research on it tonight and get him an answer for it in the morning. I'm sure he would. That's, that's a great parking lot question. I'd really like that. I'd like to know the answer to that. That's a good one. Okay, awesome. So let's move on a little bit and let's get these things going because we're coming up on those six hours. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Luis Fraga wants to know uh, if you reflash the ECU, will the PDTC uh, be erased? Okay, Luis. Um, glad. Great question. And a lot of guys are uh, have hit me up with that same question. Here's the story. You got a permanent DTC. You reflash the ECU. You didn't fix the problem. You go out on the test drive to run the monitors to get a smog test done on it, and the problem pops up again. Do you have another permanent DTC? Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, I mean, you can try to game the system. If it was an EVAP code, you can keep it up above three quarters of a tank or below a quarter tank of fuel so that it doesn't run the EVAP monitor. But aside from that, if you've got a permanent DTC, um, it's always in your best interest to fix it. <laughs> um, and the guys here at IBS 360 can give you a hand with that. Just give us a call, man. We will help you fix the root cause problem. All right. So let's see. Raphael asks us, so you could repair the problem and not clearing faults would uh, be allowed to uh, would clear the permanent uh ah, I'm trying to read this here. So, I get the idea. He, he says he's not going to clear the faults. And he's going to run through the similar conditions, mm -hmm. and it's going to recognize that he's already repaired it. He, the vehicle recognizes that the problem no longer exists under similar conditions. Guess what happens to permanent DTC? Same thing. Bye-bye. It goes away. Because it saw that it was healed. This is why I'm telling you why we run all the monitors, why clear the codes, why clear the freeze frame. When you can fix the problem and say it's an open, shorter ground, which is a fairly easy thing, it may clear the permanent DTC on startup, depending on the conditions that it saw when it set the code. And the permanent DTC is a wash. It's out of the mix. And now you're doing the smog again. You're all good to go. And that, that was smart. You know, he, he picked up on what was going on. He's got it. All right, great. So that, that's awesome. All right, so it looks like you got uh, most of the questions here. So we're going to let you go early, I think. Early? <laughs> you haven't seen what's on my desk. Uh, well, thank you guys all for being here. Um, Chris, you've done a wonderful job. I want to thank uh, my friend um, Nelson Vargas, Brandon Matthews, and Steve Caruso for giving me a hand putting this through. And then Chris, who can, who can forget Chris, man, the EMC of the century. I hope I did a good job. I hope I kept you entertained. Um, if you have any more comments or questions, you can certainly reach us at uh, Opus IVS. And I'm sure Chris or somebody will put a phone number up for us in the event that you guys want to get in touch with us. Great. So, yeah, if you guys don't have any questions, the best way to do that is uh, info at opusivs.com. Um, and we can uh, contact you can contact us there. But I guess that's it. Thank you guys for joining us. I appreciate it. Have a great day. And if you need to uh, have any more Opus webinars on IUMPR or any of the rest of the stuff, um, make Opus aware of it, and I'll get the information together for you and give you a hand. Have a great night. Thanks for being here. All right. Thanks. Have a good night, guys. Peace.